Good drizzly, windy morning to you. This is Angela with Park Rose Permaculture. You can see the snow is still in the process of melting here in Portland, Oregon. A lot of the garden, it's completely gone, but there's still large patches of it. You can see some signs of spring. One of my many rhubarbs here starting to come up through the mulch. This is a Victoria rhubarb. Right now in the garden, we have a peak opportunity to look at a concept that we can use to design our gardens better. Super evident right now. And that is the concept of microclimates. In permaculture, there are 12 principles. Principle 11 is to use the edges and value the marginal. And transitional periods between seasons are an edge where we have an opportunity to observe and use the observations that we make to plan our landscape more efficiently. Right now, we have snow melting, and snow doesn't melt uniformly across a landscape. It melts, um, oh look, my girls are like, hey, we're gonna hang out up here because it's closest to you, mom, and maybe you might have a snack. I don't right now, ladies, sorry. Um, when we look at a landscape, the snow doesn't melt evenly, and that is if we take the time to observe and interact, where the snow melts when, we can pinpoint microclimates in the garden and use them to our benefit in planning. So I thought I'd talk about a couple of different microclimate aspects, not just the snow melt, but let's start with that. So you can see here, these are uh, six of my teardrop shaped annual veggie beds and the snow melted from them first. And that's an example of good permaculture design. These beds are in a part of the garden that is commonly called a sun trap. I am facing straight north right now, and the sun comes in this way. This is the sunniest part of my yard, and that's where I want to grow my sun-loving annual veggies that are just going to soak up all those rays and benefit from them and produce the biggest, most lush tomatoes um, and, you know, ample crops of onions and things like that, things that need a lot of sun. So clearly, because it gets this direct incoming sun this way, um, we're going to see this part of the garden have the first snow melt, which is good, means I picked a good microclimate. So let, let's back up and define what is a microclimate. A microclimate is pretty self-evident. It is a small portion of the greater climate, a small area that has conditions that are different than the majority of the property, than the majority of the landscape. It has unique climatic conditions where the temperature can vary a few degrees from the surrounding area, where the um, rainfall can vary, where the wind can vary, where the sun can vary, a few degrees on average. So with that variance, you have the opportunity to push the boundaries of what you're growing where. It also means that if you don't pay attention to those microclimates, you can plant something that might thrive in the greater aspect of your garden, but it will struggle in that microclimate. So here we're seeing temperature changes. We're seeing a sunny aspect with slightly warmer temperatures thawing first. Great spot to grow our annual veggies. But then let's look here. Again, this part is straight off the back of the house, shaded. This is my rain garden and it faces full north. It's a little bit cooler here. Probably don't want to plant my sun loving, um, you know, plants that need a little bit warmer like uh, agastache and things like that are not going to do as well 
in this part. And you can see the change once we get over here, we're up on the high end of my rain garden and we're into the directly sunny area. And over here is where I grow things like echinacea, agastache, um, phacelia, things that like full sun can handle a drier area and a little bit warmer area. But down in here, I don't want to be planting those things on this side. Over here I have like columbine and some iris and I have um, some of my hebes that do well and some geraniums that tolerate more shade because I have this microclimate. It's a little cooler, a little shadier thaws out later. So while you're looking in your garden, pay attention to the snow and where it's melting and notice that the places that melt last are going to be those microclimates where it's a pocket that might be lower. So the cool air sinks into it. It might be more shaded and it's going to be a little cooler. So you don't want to grow your push crops, your crops where you are pushing the envelope like feijoas or uh, Chilean guavas. I don't want to grow those in my cooler, cold sink microclimates in my garden. Let's, let's walk around to another part of the yard and talk about some other microclimate aspects to be looking for at this seasonal time of the year when we're in transition and we're looking at those edges and those edges between microclimates can be more evident. So, hang so here I'm in the natives garden and I'm under one of my elders, which you can see I've done some radical take back because they are shrubs and they need serious, serious cutback every few years to continue being productive. So this area is a native's garden. It faces east and in much of the year it is shaded by the elderberries. And if we look here, we can look at the snow melt and say, even though there's not the shade from the elderberries, what we have here is an area that still gets shade from the neighbors next door. And also something to note about this area I have about eight inches of wood chip mulch here because this area is very soggy. So it's hard to see at this moment, but what we have here is what's called wet shade. There's two different kinds of shade, dry shade, wet shade. And one of the microclimates you can easily produce because of structures of your house combined with where the water runs on your property is a microclimate of wet shade. And that makes it perfect for ferns that like wet shade. I have more down here. When we first bought the house, this part of the yard was a mud pit. So what is it like? What is that microclimate in the rainiest part of the year, in the wettest part of the year? And I was able to assess, hey, this is really moist soil, really boggy soil. And I built up the wood chips very deeply here to help control the path. But also knowing this area retains a ton of moisture. This is where I need to be planting my ferns and other shade loving, high moisture loving plants. So that's a second microclimate. We've looked at those areas that are potentially shaded, but potentially cooler because they're lower elevation or um, they're shaded by a structure. And we also need to look at the moisture content. So particularly in the Pacific Northwest where it's a wet winter, that's a good place to look for where is boggy, where has a high level of moisture retention. But if you live elsewhere where you have a snowy winter, look for those periods of thaw. Look for those periods of thaw and where the water goes. And you can assess where you have those microclimates that are prone to being maybe muddy and holding water and areas that have higher moisture content and then plant accordingly. All right, let's check out one more type of microclimate. Okie doke, we're standing in my front yard, which is not that much to look at this time of year. And we are facing straight east into my neighbor's arborvitae hedge. You can see here, I have my blackberries trained up. I have my goji berry and wolf berry here. I have a pawpaw here, another pawpaw here. And I know because of the typical wind movement where I live, winds come in from the Columbia Gorge and my straight street runs east-west. And that means 
the winds whip in from the east incredibly strongly in the winter. So when you're looking at periods in your um, climate, in your uh, area with more extreme weather, that's a good time to notice where is the wind coming from? Where is the predominant wind and how do I plan accordingly? So for me, the front part of my yard where I have this open expanse of street here that is just like a funnel for the wind. So if I'm going to grow plants that are sensitive to wind, I need to be careful up here. And actually I ended up removing, I used to have quite a lot of honey berries up here, um, four of them. I have one left that's doing well here, but I used to have four honey berries in this bed and the wind damage for the berries that were in front of the neighbor's hedge was just severe every winter and I ended up moving them. This was not a good microclimate for my honeyberries, which cannot tolerate wind. They can tolerate a lot of cold, very, very deep cold, cannot really handle the wind that get wind damage. So here you can see, if you're not sure where the winds come from, look for the plants that are already growing. Um, I don't know if you can tell here, this is a Fijoa which was planted straight up and down and was staked the first three years of its life. Fijoa is also called pineapple guava, and it is a slow growing evergreen perennial. And growing it in my climate, it is a push plant. I am pushing the, the limits of my climate zone to grow this plant. It needs to be covered when it's little if temperatures get below 20 or 15 degrees Fahrenheit. At this age, I don't cover it, but it also doesn't love the wind. And you can see here how it is leaning. There's a younger Fijoa here also leaning. The wind is coming in this way. And it is really putting a stressor on this plant. Let's look here at this young Fijoa, which is growing in the shelter of my neighbor's hedge and it does not have that kind of wind damage. It's growing straight up and down, despite the fact that I was too lazy to ever stake it. Versus you can see the Fijo is up here on the cusp on the corner of the hedge where the wind actually rolls around the edge of the hedge. And I find that whole front bed gets a significant amount of wind. Those wind sensitive plants are leaning. Temperatures here are nice and warm, but the wind chill is a factor. It does create a microclimate where I need to be careful about growing things that can't handle high wind. And also at the same time, growing things here in another protected microclimate inside the protection of the hedge, like the goji berry and wolfberry that need a little bit warmer weather, don't like wind. Those are being grown in the protection of the hedge. So that's a microclimate here. And then again, the harsh wind whipping around here creates another microclimate I don't have anywhere else in my garden. So as permaculturists, I think that when you are planning your site, it's so important to not only look at what is happening when the garden is lush and green and when it is, um, extremely abundant in the middle of a season, but it's important to take your garden, take your property and look at it during those marginal times, right? Look at it during those times when the edge effect is strongest, when we have stronger weather events, when we have um, areas where uh, they are impacted more greatly or sheltered more greatly from those kind of extreme strong forces of nature and using that permaculture principle observe and interact to assess where our microclimates are so that we can design for every tiny aspect of our garden or we can design for peak productivity, peak resilience, we can best utilize every little bit of our garden 
and be more successful gardeners, more successful permaculturists, and more resilient. Because it's not just, hey, I live in the Pacific Northwest and I'm in climate zone 8B. It's what are the microclimates, even within my small plot, where I can push the edges, where I can grow more unusual things, and I can grow a greater diversity and that way be more resilient in the face of climate change, in the face of adverse weather events, in the face of economic insecurity, the more we can diversify what we grow, the more resilient we will be as individuals and as communities. And really take that time in the transitional periods to use the margins and assess what's going on on your property and Build that diversity so you can build that abundance. So I hope that helped give you three things to look out for in terms of microclimates. Look out for your cold sinks, your shady areas where it's a few degrees colder, or sheltered areas where it's a few degrees warmer, sunny areas. Look for those areas where at times of snow melt or times of higher rain, you have extra water retention. Notice where it's really dry and where it's really boggy. And then also check out where your winds are coming from because more edible plants than you would imagine are impacted by wind even more than cold. So take the time to check out what's going on with your sun, your drainage, and your wind and really maximize what you're able to grow. Hope that helps y'all going to head out for my run and then I think I'm going to probably work on spreading more wood chips today. I'm almost done with the pile but I'm going to make a little bit more progress. Hope you all are staying safe and warm. Thanks.